All right, well, welcome everybody to our um, April edition of our webinar Wednesdays. And we're excited this morning to have Erin from American Income Life Insurance to come talk to us about our insurance policy and what it covers and what it doesn't cover. And I just want to say, I'm really excited to see so many support staff on today and y'all really keep us going and to happy Administrative Professionals Day to all of you. So today is the day to celebrate you. And thank you for all you do. I know um, Holly and Liz in our office um, put up with me and keep me going. So we appreciate all that you do and for jumping on this call and helping to keep your agents in your office rolling in the correct direction. So have all your questions ready and Aaron will be able to answer them for you. So I'm gonna go ahead and um, share my screen and I wanna remind you, I'm looking at next month, hopefully we're gonna do something on taxes because we all know that we have a lot of questions on that. We'll take off the months of June and July due to achievement days and fairs and get back going in August. So I don't have a date set for May yet, but um, hopefully I can set that pretty soon. So I'm gonna share my screen and turn it over to Erin this morning. Erin? Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, hopefully you can uh, hear me okay. Um, and Megan will let me know, hopefully, if I have any uh, technology issues. Once I get started here in a couple of minutes, I probably will go ahead and turn off my camera just because our internet does seem to do a little better uh, here without the video going. So just to keep that going. Um, in the meantime, you may see at least one of our cats behind us. <laughs> so we'll see if anybody else comes up. Um, but good morning. Um, my name is Erin Bain. I'm the director of the American Income Life Special Risk Division. Um, and Megan asked me to kind of come on today and give you all a little bit of um, an overview as a refresher for those of you who have been around for a while or a, you know, just informational purposes for everybody who's new. Um, so hopefully this will be uh, familiar to those of you who have heard it before. Um, and we won't have any major surprises, but if you do, we'll work through those things. Um, I would say it's probably best to uh, type questions in the chat box and uh, hold them or, and or hold them towards the end. Um, I probably will, I will not be able to kind of flip back and forth between chat and um, and seeing everything, um, you know, while I'm talking and the cat has decided to jump on top of the snake cage where she's not supposed to be. Another reason that the camera will go off is those distractions. <laughs> um, <laughs> So, uh, so yeah, so we'll go through those things and then I will address questions kind of at the end because I may get to some things that you have questions about that kind of stuff too. So, um, all right, I'm going to go ahead and turn off my video um, and then Megan, if you will go to the next slide for me. Um, and Megan, whenever you flip over, you can go ahead and just populate the whole slide. I don't know how, if it's set up for animations or not. So, um, here we go, just a little bit of information about the uh, Special Risk Division of AIL. We started working with 4-H and Extension specifically in 1952, so we've, we've been around for a long time. Um, our, our partnership with Extension are really strong throughout the country, and we have always tried to keep all of our policies extremely affordable so that they can be useful for that population. Um, we work with uh, NA4H YDP, as well as some of the other extension professional associations, um, ESP, NACAA, uh, NACADEP, all the letters I can't remember, but lots of them. <laughs> um, and we sponsor as well as work uh, as exhibitors at those organizations, as well as a lot of different other youth serving organizations, camp, conference centers, universities, etc. cetera. Um, so that photo there of me uh, is from when I was a County 4-H agent in North Carolina, one of my embryology chicks. I grew up as a 4-H'er in Virginia and have been involved in some way, shape, or form since I was seven. So that's 119 years now that I've been involved with 4-H. Um, but uh, it, it, it definitely is a passion of mine uh, personally and professionally. And so I'm really glad that I got the opportunity to uh, continue to work with 4-H and just in a different aspect 
um, now working with the insurance company. Um, the special risk division motto is serving those who serve others. And it really is extremely important to us to, to be able to provide the coverage that we do for those of you out there in the counties who are doing really important things. Um, you can flip to the next slide for me. Let's see. Okay. So a few things to know about our, our two types of policies. We have annual and special activities policies. Um, the main thing that you wanna know, and again, we really keep those low cost. We've kept those consistent for as long as we can. Our coverage is blanket accident policy, um, which is different in, in terms of uh, scope and benefits from liability policies. Uh, liability policies, when you're talking about those, those are usually things that are set up either by the university, by your county, that are you're talking about, you know, half a million, million dollar limits, our policies are, are different from that. We do have a small staff. Uh, there are three of us full-time, including myself. We have a claims department is one person, accounting department is one person. <laughs> um, so we are very confident um, and really proud of the fact that when you call or email, you're gonna get an actual human pretty quickly. Um, and that's something that's really important to us. We don't have any network of providers, so you don't have to worry for our purposes about making sure you go to a facility that has, um, that is within network for our insurance. Our policies are able to be primary. Most people treat them as secondary. So what that means is if there is a family that does not have personal insurance, which we find less common these days, um, with Affordable Care Act and things like that, but it does still happen. If you do have a family uh, or a participant that doesn't have any major medical coverage, we are able to pay primary, uh, but in most cases, we are treated as a secondary policy and come in after the fact of personal major medical insurance to help uh, pay any remaining outstanding bills or uh, reimburse for things like copays, deductibles, um, prescription costs, et cetera. We do try to work as quickly as possible because we understand the, um, the strain that uh, medical bills, unpaid medical bills can put on families. So once we have all the information that we need in hand, we do try to get those claims checks paid out as quickly as possible. And ultimately, like I said, our goal for our division is really to provide reduced stress uh, for you as extension professionals, as well as the volunteers that you work with and the families of the participants. Go on to the next slide. So uh, a few things to note about the North Dakota uh, 4-H annual policy. We started this back a few years ago um, when uh, Brad was still in the um, uh, the state program leader role, I believe. Um, and so what this policy does is it, it is designed to cover all of your enrolled 4-Hers and volunteers during adult supervised group activities. So that means all of the, you know, kind of the examples listed here, um, as well as just about anything else that you can think of, as long as it is an approved scheduled group activity for 4-H. It does not include individual activities. So, you know, a youth working with their, their livestock show project animal, um, the four members of the Smith family who happen to be members of the shooting sports club practicing archery in their backyard, et cetera. If you're not sure, you can always contact us um, to get a, a handle on whether we would be covered or not. New members who enroll after the policy is established are automatically covered until the policy renews. So that way, uh, no one at the county level or at the state level is having to look at your uh, 4-H online or ES-237 you know, numbers throughout the year and kind of compare and say, oh, well, we had you know 400 in May and now we have 700 in June because folks are uh, enrolling so they can go to camp and do day, do summer fun and those kind of things. So new members are automatically covered uh, throughout the rest of the year. 
Um, and it does cover expenses incurred from 52 weeks of the date of the incident. So what that means is not that <clears throat> if someone has an injury uh, at a at a 4-H event in, in February and they don't get it treated until the next January that we would cover it. But it does mean that if the incident is reported, a claim is filed and there are approved bills, we may be able to continue paying for ongoing treatment for up to 52 weeks from the accident up to the policy maximum. So if there are situations where someone requires um, physical therapy or surgery or something like that a couple of months down the line, we can continue to pay up to the policy maximum for that. Um, okay, on to the next slide. Just a few things, I'm not gonna read through this whole list, but uh, a few things that are not covered under the annual policy. This is consistent across the board for all of our policies. So it's not something that is unique to the North Dakota annual policy. These are excluded under, under all annual policies. The main things that I always want to hit on these are that um, illness is not covered under the annual policy. Um, worker injuries from workers' comp, so staff injuries would not be covered under, uh, under this policy. Downhill winter sports are excluded. So anytime you have skiing, tubing, sledding, uh, et cetera, any of that cannot be covered under the annual policy. And then youth under the age of five. We have that across the board for all of our policies, that minimum um, 4-H Cloverbud age is what we go with. We do have some coverage for illness uh, at the 25 and 30 cent level under annual, under, excuse me, under the special activities policies, and you can cover downhill winter sports under special activities policies as well, which leads me to uh, telling you, I think there's one more slide with the overall benefits, so we'll go to the next slide for the benefits of the annual policy, just so that you can see what these benefits are. Um, <clears throat> the, uh, the maximum of $5,000 for uh, medical and hospital treatment for is sufficient, we find in most cases, for most of the typical injuries that you have. Um, of course, if there's something that is uh, catastrophic, or, you know, things like that, we, there are cases where that maximum, it doesn't meet the full needs. But it certainly goes a long way in the right direction, which is what we're hoping for. Um, the next slide, we'll start talking a little bit more about uh, the special activities coverage, what that is, and when you may want to look into that. Um, so the, as we talked about before, the special activity, excuse me, the annual policy covers all of your adult supervised group activities when everybody that is participating is an enrolled 4-H'er or volunteer. Um, so there are some circumstances where you would want special activities coverage. Some common examples are listed here on this slide, overnight travel events, anything where you want illness coverage, again, that downhill winter sports. If you have events where um, there is a mixed participation between 4-H'ers and non 4 hers so if you do a day camp, something like that, or any high risk programs that may include volunteers that have not been covered by any annual policy. So a couple of things on this. Megan, I'm not sure if you click on the link from that slide, will it take you to the browser window? If not, that's okay. Um, Just thinking about it. <laughs> I can, I can, I can get it. Is it? So this is just, just real quick, just for those of you that may not have filled one of these out before, um, setting up a special activities policy is extremely simple. Um, we have this link that I've included in there, and then we'll, it's also in my email signature. We try to make sure that it is uh, available and out there, and I think it probably is linked somewhere on in your internet. That's what a lot of states do so that you have that link available somewhere, but you can always go and bookmark this. Um, this is the activity report form that you would fill out in advance of your event anytime that you need special activities coverage. Um, it is 
super quick, hopefully easy. Uh, all you have to do is select your organization type from the drop down box there um, as 4-H and Cooperative Extension, and then fill in your contact information. Um, sometimes people get tripped up over organization and group name. You can put in there whatever makes the most sense to you for the event that you're holding. So if your organization can be Slope County 4-H, and then your group name can be the ABC 4-H Club. Um, whatever makes the most sense to you. You can also have the same thing in those blanks, you know, based on whatever the event is. Um, and then you fill in, make sure you fill in all of these uh, fields that have a required uh, little red asterisk beside them. And then you scroll down to the bottom and fill in the activity descriptions. You can add multiple rows to this. So if you have, let's say, you know, three to five day camps that you that would be coming up or however many throughout the summer and you want to go ahead and submit all of those at one time, you can add as many rows as you need to to give a brief description of the activity. Again, whatever makes the most sense to you, the start and end dates, the estimated number of participants. This is always an estimated number and it never has to be adjusted up, down, or otherwise <laughs> uh, before your event. So you put in this estimated number in advance of the event, and then you pay for the actual number or the policy minimum after the event is over. If you ever wanna see a comparison of what the different special activities rates are, you can go to this file, go to this, excuse me, this, this page and click on the, after you select 4-H and extension at the top, this view rates option will come up. And if you click on that, it will give you a pop-up window that shows the comparisons between plans A, B, and C. Um, typically, for a one-day event, um, plan A may be sufficient for, for your needs, depending on, you know, the level of activity that you're doing, you know, whether it's high risk or not. You may be able to you know, save on budget and do things like that if you want to keep it with that plan A. However, if you have less than 27 participants, um, your minimum pre, you're going to have to round up and pay the minimum $8 premium anyway. So I tend to recommend the plan C rate if and when it fits into your budget. Um, you can always do the math between the three different options and figure out what makes the most sense to you and your program for that activity. You know, again, a, a crafting day may be a little different than kayaking or rock climbing or whatever. So you can make those decisions. Um, if you'll close that pop-up window out, Megan. And then, so one, uh, again, one thing to be just really sure of, we do have some issues with the, the form. Make sure that you fill out every required field and that you don't have any extra rows when you're going to submit because that will keep it from submitting. And then you click on the little, I'm not a robot guy and submit your form and you're all set. You can do that anytime in advance of the activity. I tend to recommend trying to get it done at least 24 hours in advance. But again, as a 4-H agent, I vividly remember filling out this form at 4 or 5, 4.55 p.m. while I had kids in the van waiting to go to teen retreat. So the activity reports are time stamped when they come in um, and coverage will be bound from that point forward. But you do have to make sure that you get it before the event starts. Because if you have kids coming in at 9 a.m., and somebody gets injured at 9.30, we don't get the activity report until noon, unfortunately coverage is going to be denied. So you just have to really be, be mindful of that. Um, we can go back to the PowerPoint, that would be great. Um, so again, those are some kind of common examples of when you might want to think about special activities coverage. The next slide has a flow chart um, that I have sent to Megan as a PDF that she can share as well. I'm not sure how well it shows up on the, the PowerPoint screen. Sometimes it's a little fuzzy, um, but basically this gives you a general idea of how to think about 
planning for your events when you're going to have and when you may want to have special activities policies. So if if everybody is participating, everybody that is participating in the event is a enrolled 4 hr and covered under the North Dakota annual policy, there's only a handful of situations where you may want to get that special activities want or need to get that special activities coverage. If everybody is not a 4 hr then you would look at the right hand side of the flow chart and kind of try to decide what what the most appropriate coverage is going to be. Um, on to the next slide, please. <clears throat> so just some highlights of uh, special activities coverage in general. Um, and I've talked about some of this before, but just so that you are aware, it does start at 20 cents per person per day. It's 20, 25, or 30 cents per person per day. The $8 minimum premium does uh, apply to the whole event for programs that are on multiple consecutive days, but for each day for multiple non-consecutive days. Um, you can include all of your registered participants and volunteers in an event, um, but it does not cover spectators and members of the general public. So I'm going to hit hard on this bullet point. If you take out special activities coverage for anyone for an event, you must cover everyone. Because it is blanket coverage, there is not a way to distinguish, let's say, for something like a livestock show. Um, we have 40 kids that are 4-Hers and 40 kids that are FFA members. If you take out that special activities coverage for anybody, you cover everybody. And the reason for that, again, it's it's blanket coverage, so it it is, is supposed to be inclusive of everybody in the group. But for an extreme example of why we would why we require that is if there is something that is like a, a major weather event, a tornado hits the building for a big event, something like that. Um, there would be no way for us to sort out who should be covered under annual, who should be covered under special activities, and there are different benefit levels and things under each of those. So we want to make sure that everybody is covered. You count and cover all of your registered participants, whether they are 4-Hers or not. Um, again, accidents and some illnesses, it does require no upfront premium, so you don't have to pay until after the event is complete. That also means that there's no penalty for canceling coverage. So if you set up coverage for an event or a series of events and you have low registration or there's bad weather or something like that and you need to cancel, we just need notification in writing of that in order to be able to cancel the request. And there's no uh, premium due for that. Um, you can use this coverage for collaborative programs. So if you're working with your local soil and water conservation on a field day, if you're working with a school system, if you're any of those kind of things that you're doing where 4-H and Extension is planning and executing the event, you would be you know, assisting in planning and executing the event, um, you would be able to use this type of coverage for that. Um, the next slide just has that same um, coverage uh, option chart, so you can see what the benefits are for each one of those different options. Again, um, the $8 minimum is required for all, for each activity that you do, so depending on the numbers that you have, you can choose any of, any or all of any of those options, whichever makes the most sense for you. Uh, a couple of just general things on the next slide, um, just to, to be prepared for when you are having events and you think you, you know, may potentially have injuries, which is every event, right? So um, are drilled into, into my head very often during uh, agent training was hope for the best, plan for the worst right? So we always want to be aware of what are the things that, that are potential um, stuff that can happen. And with kids, we know that, you know, even the things that are planned down to the minute, they are going to find a way to, you know, trip over the door frame. They're going to find a way to do something and, and there can be an accident. Um, so make sure that you and any volunteers that are super supervising activities are aware of all of the guidelines that are required. Um, so 
reporting injuries is not just not just to us, uh, but make sure that you're aware of what you need to do in terms of reporting to NDSU, incident reports, accident treatment, et cetera. Make sure that you're doing all of that. Um, our AIL policy, because it is not a uh, major medical policy, um, there's not necessarily a need to have that policy number with you when you, if you have to take a kid to the urgent care or to the hospital, they're not going to know what to do with it, just to be completely candid with you, um, because it is not, you know, Blue Cross Blue Shield, Anthem, whatever, those, those are the types of policies they're used to dealing with, they may not know what to do with it, but it doesn't hurt to have it and just have it in your back pocket, be aware of it, and when you do have to fill out a claim form, you will need, um, if it's under the statewide annual policy, you'll need that A and D policy number. Um, if it is under special activities, the policy numbers are always 718 and then A, B, or C based on the rate option. And the serial, that policy number as well as the serial number is how the special activities policies will be designated if you have to file a claim. And this policy and serial number will be in your confirmation of coverage email. So make sure you hang on to those until after an event is complete. Don't, don't let those go. Just a few things about filing a claim um, on the next slide. I'm not gonna read through this word for word, uh, but the, the most important thing to do um, when you're filing a claim is get that uh, form into us as soon as possible. It doesn't have to be the day of, it doesn't have to be the day after, you don't have to be faxing me from, from the fairgrounds, okay? Don't panic about that. Get your immediate needs and, and treatment and stuff taken care of as soon as possible, but try to get it to me within the next week or two because we do occasionally have claims, like I was, I think I mentioned before, where somebody says, oh, it's not a big deal, and they don't file a claim, and then we have no way of knowing whether the injury actually happened at the fair or the football camp that they went to the week after. Um, so it's really important that you get that sent in to us uh, in a timely manner and that you're as detailed as possible with that. Um, it is always better for us to have the form on file and not need it than the other way around. So if we have the form on file and it ends up being something minor and all the parents or guardians are out is, you know, a $50 copay, they may not want to move forward with a claim. But in, in the, the case where something bigger does happen, we always want to make sure that we have that information. So hang on to this, send those forms in as soon as, as, soon as possible. Um, and make sure that you are paying attention. If you do file a claim, pay attention to your email, pay attention to your hard copy mail, because anytime there is communication about the claim, there will be uh, copies sent to uh, your county office um, as the, the policy holder, as well as the parent or guardian, the family of the, of the member that we, or volunteer. So keep that in mind. And if we ask you for stuff and ask for your help um, in communicating, please make sure that you're, you're doing that. Um, just real quick, a couple of things about COVID. Um, we're, we're down to the point where I think pretty much, and that's on the next slide, Megan, um, <clears throat> we're down to the point where, you know, COVID's not gone, right? But it is uh, fading away a little bit in terms of what we're seeing at <clears throat> um, the at normal, quote unquote, 4-H activities, okay? So we do have coverage for illness under the special activities policies at 25 and 30 cent, but in two years, we have not had any COVID claims for 4-H or other youth participants um, because we have exclusions on pre-existing conditions and the illness must manifest itself during the covered event. So COVID is rarely able to be tracked that way. Um, because of the incubation, incubation and asymptomatic periods. We have had some cases where uh, camp staff have been able to be covered for COVID because of their, they've been on site for an extended period of time and their only exposure to um, the virus could be at camp, et cetera. Um, and then just, you know, if and when things change at some point, 
make sure that you're always following whatever guidelines the, the university sets in place at any given time about whether it's COVID protocols or, or otherwise, right? So we have, we work with all 50 states. Uh, we have policies all over the place. And our general rule for, for coverage is that it has to be following whatever your state's 4-H rules and guidelines are. So different states have different rules in terms of um, age limits, you know, clover buds can only do horseless horse activities. Um, you have to wear a helmet when you ride, uh, you know, any of those things that are, that are rules for your state 4-H program are what we view to be rules that are there for a reason. And we follow along with those. So anything, you know, it's become more of a thing to remind folks of during, during COVID. Um, but it is important that you're following whatever your, your state 4-H guidelines are as of the time of the event. Um, on to the next slide, which is the most exciting one because it's the last one. Um, but it's also just where I will take the opportunity to um, open it up for, for questions that you have. Um, and if it's something that you feel like is really specific to your county uh, and you, you don't want to bring it up to the group, that's totally fine. There's my email. Um, we are still primarily working from home, but um, I can get voicemails and things like that. And, you know, I'm, I'm happy to, to schedule time to chat with you if we need to do that. But at this point, just kind of want to give you all the opportunity to, to ask any questions that you might have. Um, Megan, if you can help me manage that, either, you know, folks can put it in the chat or if you want to do some kind of, you know, raise hand uh, situation um, and we can we can just go from there and I'll try to try to answer whatever I can. Okay, um, yeah, thanks, Erin. This was very wonderful and fantastic and very informative. So I learned some new stuff today as well. So now is the time for y'all to just ask Erin some questions. You have her undivided attention for the next while she's on. So please feel free to open up your mic, ask your question, or you can type it in the chat box, either one you feel comfortable doing. Hey, Erin. Um, I had a shooting sports in February and it was kind of, it was a three day event. So we had kids on Saturday or Friday, Saturday and Sunday. Mm -hmm. And so two days we did archery. It was Friday evening and Saturday, but we didn't have the same kids there on both days. We had like 40 kids there one day and then like 70 or 80 the next day. Mm -hmm. And they weren't the same. How would we put that in? So what you can do if you have multiple day events where there are going to be different numbers, you can put each line of that or, you know, each day of that event on a different row when you fill out the special activities report form. Um, so, and that's really common, right? So for shooting sports, as well as things like uh, livestock shows, maybe, you know, cattle is going to be on one day, uh, sheep are going to be in another, goats are going to be on another, those kind of things. Um, it is fine for you to put, you know, shooting sports tournament Friday, you know, 90 participants. And we don't need a breakdown in terms of, because we don't request the names. We don't request uh, any specific information about any of those participants unless there is a claim. You just need to be able to verify that, you know, yes, Sally Smith was registered for this event on this day and would have been covered under the special activities policy on that day. So it's up to you to kind of keep track of um, the numbers on each on the different day and how you would how you would report that. And you know, pay for the actual number after the event is complete. Thank you. Okay, I see a question from Sarah Crimmins. Um, for our county achievement days in July, we will need to take out special activity insurance, correct? Because this event is for each members and the public, not so, for each enrollment. Yes, so achievement days are, is that the, that's the equivalent of your county fairs, is that correct? Same idea. Yeah. Same, same general idea. Mm -hmm. So you, if everybody that is participating in, you know, 4-H events as a part of that, of the achievement days is enrolled, then you would, they would be covered under the annual policy. We are not able to cover spectators and members of the general public for larger events like that under 
any circumstance. So if you have um, people who are involved in the operation of the event, they can be counted and covered, but they cannot, it cannot be just folks coming to visit the achievement days, walk through the exhibits or barns or visit the midways or any of those kind of things. It would have to be people who are, again, the phrase we use is involved in the operation of the event. So typically, if let's say if there's a livestock show, um, you would have that would include your youth exhibitors who are in the ring with their animals. It might be ringmasters, judges, parents who are helping with uh, fitting and unloading trailers in the barn. But it would not include, you know, brother, sister, grandma who is, you know, coming to sit in the audience and watch. Same thing goes for like a shooting sports tournament. Your kids that are shooting your line judges, your coaches, all of those folks would be covered or able to be covered, but people who are just coming for the audience are not covered. So you had mentioned before that if you cover one person, you have to cover all. So it doesn't matter, like Achievement Day, that's a 4-H activity. They are enrolled in 4-H online, the members that show at the Achievement Day. But since we have to cover one judge because they're not enrolled in 4-H online as a volunteer, that means we have to cover everybody that's involved? If it really is just that one judge, then it would be up to you to, you know, make that determination about whether you need to cover them or not. There may be some coverage um, through this, and this would be a question for Megan, um, or, you know, it may be on an individual basis. If the judge is somebody that is hired, that's a professional judge, they may have their own, you know, insurance that is a part of that. They may be uh, covered under workers' comp, or you may be able to, you know, enroll them as a volunteer. There, there, there are kind of workarounds that you can look into for that. Um, and I would not, I wouldn't be able to speak to the specifics of like what the university liability policies are or um, or that. So you may want to look into that with Megan or with the judges to confirm what type of coverage they already have. Okay, and then maybe this question is more for Megan, but Megan, our, um, our students in archery are actually enrolled in 4-H online as a club. Does that mean then that they are covered, that they do not have, that we don't have to have special coverage for them? Right. If they're enrolled in 4-H online as a, you know, in the, in the 4-H online program, like your volunteers or your 4-Hers, then mm -hmm. they are covered because they are okay. enrolled and listed and accounted for. Okay. Yeah. That's a good question. Thanks for asking that, Katie. Yep. Thank you. Um, and I see uh, Sandy has a question. Is there a way to get a hard copy of the policy for our office? And so I think um, this is a good time just to remind everybody and show you that where this is on our Google Drive. So I'm going to share my screen and I think this might answer your question, Sandy. So um, this is just like our 4-H um, Google Drive we just recently set up. So if you all come here to um, staff resources and you click on staff resources, okay, so you're going to see different pieces that you could use coming up here. Then we created this one link called 4-H insurance. And so this is the flow chart here that Aaron was talking about. Um, and then also like what is not covered. And I'm gonna put up, this is where I'll put the information that Aaron just shared with us today. But I'm thinking this is might be what you're talking about, Sandy. Is that what you, the policy that you wanted to look at? Does that help? Let's see. Okay, great. So yeah, all your stuff is in this um, folder. And then also we created this little document so when you forget, because I always forget where things are, because in the moment you're like, ah, what do I do? So go to this folder and um, you can see like where to click for the special activities insurance. And then if you click on this link right there, it'll take you to this button. And we put here, click here. So you'll know where it says activity report and that'll take you to where Aaron was um, talking about how to fill everything out. So when you forget where to go, just try to find this folder and it'll tell you how to get back to the report that Erin was describing to us. So I hope that will help y'all with that. Okay, um, Sue says, do participants and those involved in the operation of events sign in when they show up at the event 
both those enrolled in 4-H online as well as those who are not enrolled? We don't make a specific requirement about that, but that would be general best practice so that you would be able to verify again that yes, uh, John Smith was helping that day at the show, um, that there's some kind of sign in, some kind of, you know, registration form, even if it's just the most basic of, of forms. Uh, again, when I was an agent, you know, we had somebody walking around the barn at livestock at the livestock show with a clipboard and saying, have you signed in? Have you signed in? You know, like, so, um, that, that helps you keep track of everything for, um, for your records, both for special activities coverage, as well as just for your general reporting, um, that you may have to do for the university. I have one more question. If we have an event where someone comes and just, for example, a judge or they help at a 4-H event and they are enrolled in 4-H online through a different county, are they still covered under the policy or do we have to have them in our actual enrollment with our club or our county? Because North Dakota has a statewide policy, they would be covered uh, across county lines. So they can do activities and or you know work and volunteer in any county. Thank you. If we're doing an overnight activity, like an overnight trip with multiple counties, would each county want to do it for their own kids or just one special activities policy? I would recommend having one person do it for for the group, um, just for simplicity's sake. But and then you know you could send invoices to your individual county if you want to handle it that way. Um, you know, again, you're going to end up paying an eight dollar minimum per county, even if you've only got five kids for each county. Um, whereas if you combine it, you might end up having only eight dollars for the total event. Would we need special activities coverage for say a 4-H soup fundraiser event? So I, I don't like to say need, it's kind of, it's kind of up to you in terms of, you know, whether you want to do that. If it is a sit down event um, where you're having, like everybody is coming to have their, their soup dinner, um, you would be able to take out special activities coverage for that. Uh, if it's something where they're coming and they're picking up their, their quart of, uh, of stew and heading down the road, um, you wouldn't really be able to cover folks with that anyway, because it's not a controlled environment. People would be coming and going and you wouldn't have a defined um, time where folks will, will be in the same room at the same time. Um, and it's really, it's really difficult to like say who was there exactly from, you know, 4.30 p.m. to 4.37 p.m. and that kind of thing. Um, but you can you can consider it certainly if it's a if it's a sit down type event. It would not include uh, this coverage would not include um, typically coverage for uh, a foodborne illness because if for a, an event like that, like that's a one day thing because again, just like with COVID, it has to manifest itself during the event. So if someone eats something and then gets sick. 12 or 24 hours later, it still would not be covered. Thank you. Erin, I have a question. Okay, so um, we have youth that are older and some are youth and some are volunteers because of their age. Mm -hmm. And as they travel to some of our events that are overnight events that we get coverage for, mm -hmm. um, and then they need to um, we usually say, you know, our event starts when they leave home and when they get home because, mm -hmm. um, you know, their behavior in that time, mm -hmm. but would it also cover an accident or something on the way? Yes. Direct travel to and from the event is covered. Um, so, you know, again, the example that I use for that is, you know, if they're going they're um, and they're coming straight to camp or they're coming straight to your office, those things are covered. If they stop at the mall on the way, if they stop at, you know, those kind of things on the, you know, it, it, 
is not covered. Um, so I would, you know, advise that they need to kind of get straight there and back. Um, but we do have, you know, vehicle accidents that are covered for events. So then when we fill out the form, does the event start? Like what time do we have the event start then when our actual event starts or when the travel starts? So our form does not ask for the, the start time. Oh. Um, it just asks for the date. So we, you, we wouldn't, we don't get that far into the micromanagement of it. If essentially, if you tell us the kid was on their way to this event that was, you know, beginning at 4 PM and they had an accident at 3:30. you know, you as the 4-H professional, we would, we would take that. Um, okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, I was just going to ask, can somebody share with our group too, a question, some questions I've had too, is how do y'all pay for this in the county? And so I know it's um, not, it's county specific. So can somebody maybe share um, what funds you use or how you pay for it when you follow up with Aaron? Because I know everybody does it different. So maybe just a couple people say how they pay for the insurance um, and get that money to Aaron. In our county, when we um, take out a policy or whatever, we just use donation funds because we see it as part of our operating. Um, and we have donors every year that pay for funding for all of our operating expenses. So we just have it as part of that. Thanks, Katie. So does that come from your 4-H council? It is. It's, it's all our 4-H council that um, gets the donations and pays, pays the bills. Yep. Okay. So um, Jackie says 4-H Leaders Council, 4-H Leaders Council is kind of your council would pay for it. Tori says 4-H Council pays for the insurance, but we have checks in the office. So I'm the one who fill out the paperwork and send in the checks. Our county council pays for all of it. So um, also, I guess if you had an individual club, they could also pay for it as well. Um, does anybody do anything differently if you don't have a council? I guess another idea could be if your county commissioners support you from your county supported funds from your extension funds, maybe that could be a possibility you could look to. Um, but yeah, it looks like our county councils and maybe clubs are the best bet. So thank you all for sharing that. That was a question I've gotten a couple of times. Like, how do you pay for this? Yeah, and unfortunately, I know a lot of folks, um, you know, ask about, um, ACH or electronic payments, uh, P cards and those kinds of things. And we are not set up to take uh, any online or over the phone payments. So it does have to be a check coming from somewhere. Anybody so else? I'm <laughs> um, so we have a club that goes on a ski, you know, day ski trip every year they should probably be getting a special activities policy. I don't know if they have been before, but they need to, or they should. How is it? Sorry. If they want coverage, they need to get special activities okay. because but downhill winter sports is specifically excluded from the annual. Okay. Hey, Aaron, when you said the air travel is, you said that's not covered? Correct. In the general policy. Correct. Yes. So, and, and it's not covered under special activities either. So they can be, they'll be covered, you know, well, they're, when they're walking on the plane and when they get off on the other side, like if you're going to a national conference or Congress or any of those kinds of things, they are covered, you know, up to, um, but not, you know, while they're in the air. Um, that also would include, you know, we've had questions about hot air balloons and things like that. So those, any kind of air travel uh, is excluded. Does anybody have any specific shooting sports questions? I feel like we get a lot of those questions about shooting sports, about who's covered at an event or who's not, since we have a lot of multi-county and state events there shooting it's actually for hipology do i need to put down each time we go because sometimes we'll stay overnight in a hotel 
um, I need to put that down every time we go for a special, correct? Or is that a blanket? If everybody who is going for that Hippology competition is enrolled as a 4-H'er -er or a volunteer, they would be covered under the annual policy. You could consider getting special activities policies if you wanted to have coverage for illness uh, for those events, but their accidents would be covered overnight under the annual policy without any additional coverage. Okay, thank you. Well, like I said, and I'm happy to hang on for a few minutes. I don't want to feel anybody to feel like they're rushed. I am, am available to stay on for a few more minutes. But if you do have questions that you feel like are more individual and you want to reach out to me directly, please feel free to do so. Um, like I said, Megan is going to share uh, a PDF of my PowerPoint today. Um, and I think she's going to put it up on that, that Google Drive and you know potentially have other methods of sharing that. And my contact information is in there. Um, I always encourage people to to reach out, call, email, carrier pigeon, whatever you need to, to get in touch with me. Um, like I said, I, uh, you know, I bleed green. I have been there, done that, collected the 100 gallon tub of t-shirts to prove it for my 4-H career. Um, so I really, you know, want to be there for you, be, be a resource and be somebody who can, can help you um, because I believe in what you're doing. Thank you everybody for joining us today. I hope you'll have a good rest of your Wednesday and I will stay on here with Aaron. And like I said, I will get these up for y'all in the Google Drive. And if you have questions, you can email me and I can get to Aaron so we can make sure we have all your questions answered. So thank you everybody for joining today. Thanks y'all.